I was telling somebody last night, it seems about the same to me. Uh, there wasn't any wall when I came before, and there's no wall now. Uh, um, I'm, I'm flattered at being, uh, being called the only deadline. Well, I guess I am the only deadline poet now. Uh, John Alamang of the Globe and Mail in Toronto uh, wrote a poem once a week for the uh, Globe and Mail. Uh, he doesn't do it anymore, but while he did do it, we we uh, formed an organization called uh, International Deadline Poet Organization, uh, or IDPO for short. Um, the fact that he doesn't do it anymore means that, well, it would mean that his uh, membership in IDPO is hanging by a thread, uh, but that would be a metaphor, and we discourage metaphors. And, uh, I'm, I'm particularly ba uh, happy to be here for the Richard Holbrook lecture. Uh, I knew Richard for many years, and um, he was a man of enormous energy. When people talked about becoming energy independent in America, I thought <laughs> if we could just hook up some of the power grids to Richard, uh, we'd be fine. Um, and also, he had what a quality which isn't uh, normally connected with diplomacy, and that is audacity. And uh, I think that's why this place exists, because uh, he was audacious enough uh, not to know that what he wanted done couldn't possibly be done. Um, I uh, didn't have a, uh, an opportunity to serve in the Foreign Service myself, partly because my, my language problem. Uh, like many Americans, uh, I have difficulty with foreign languages. I tried to learn Spanish for many decades. Um, <laughs> I think of my attacks on the Spanish language sort of like those drug busts you see <laughs> in television uh, where the guys with the windbreakers that say uh, FBI or DEA uh, have a battering ram against the door. Uh, Mine is the same, except my windbreaker says, yo hablo espanol. <laughs> um, I, I, sp I, speak, I speak a little French, uh, but I don't do verbs. Uh, I find that trying to do verbs will ruin your vacation uh, every time. Um, I, uh, I used to speak, have a few verbs. I even have had some what we would call at home Sunday go-to-meeting verbs, like où se trouve la plage? <laughs> uh, where does it find itself the beach? Um, but I gave that up, too. The, the beach knows where it is. Um, I think very little Italian. I found, uh, when my wife and I used to travel in Italy, I found uh, it it was helpful to call her La Principessa. <laughs> uh, it helped the service in the hotels a lot. <laughs> I would say things like, the drain in the bathtub's a bit slow for La Principessa, and sure enough. Um, I, um, I'm very sad not to, not to lo know Chinese, because a lot of restaurants in Chinatown have Chinese wall signs uh, that uh, makes me think that the other people in the restaurant are getting something I really want <laughs> and don't know how to order. Um, I carry a card. I didn't bring it with me because I didn't think we'd be eating Chinese food much here. But uh, it says in Chinese, please bring me some of what the people at the next table are having. <laughs> um, uh, this is dangerous, I found, because uh, I, I knew mm. I, um, a wine and food writer named Finnegan who lived in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and he went to Tokyo, and he took the trouble to learn enough Japanese to find his way around restaurants. And he was in, in uh, Tokyo one day, and something absolutely marvelous was at the table next to him that the man was eating. And so Finnegan called the waiter over and said, could you please bring me some of what the man at the next table is having? Waiter looked puzzled. Uh, went over, had a word with the man, uh, <laughs> picked up his plate and brought it to Finnegan. Uh, so 
I'm, I'm quite aware of this deficiency that I have about <laughs> languages. Uh, I sometimes, when I think of my obituary, and reporters think of their obituary a lot because, because if you're a reporter, you get a pretty decent sized obituary. It's a matter of professional courtesy. And, um, and I always think the subhead of my obituary is going to be monolingual reporter succumbs. <laughs> um, uh, so I, the languages were not my, my big subject in school. Geography was my subject. I love geography. Uh, you can imagine how uh, distressed I get when I read these surveys that the average high school senior in America thinks Alabama is the capital of Chicago or something <laughs> like that. Um, and I think this love was formed in early car trips with my family. Uh, I grew up in Kansas City, and we used to take long trips in the summer. Uh, Kansas City is what the real estate people will call equally convenient to either coast. <laughs> uh, uh, and sometimes we came east, but we us usually went west. And my father would be in the front seat pointing out the buttes and the mesas. And my sister and I would be in the back seat arguing over territory. <laughs> uh, I know that the people in this room were probably above that as children. Um, <laughs> but we had something ferocious going on. Not as bad as somebody who told me that her brother complained to their parents once, he's looking out my window. It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> We didn't go that far, but it was, it was bad enough. Uh, I used to compare it to the like geopolitical border tensions, uh, like along the border between, say, Finland and the old Soviet Union. Uh, I played Finland. Uh, my sister, the oppressor, um, played the Soviet Union. Uh, and then my father said something that now sounds quite retrograde, and, but he was traditionally raised, and he didn't mean anything by it. He, he said to me, we do not hit girls. Uh, <laughs> it's very damaging to my cause, I think. Uh, he said, we do not hit girls. You will never hit your sister again. Uh, my sister was not visited with a similar injunction. Um, <laughs> So I, um, I became a unilaterally disarmed Finland. <laughs> um, uh, I now think if I hadn't had to concentrate on a sister with uh, expansionist backseat policies, um, I would now know the difference between a butte and a mesa. Um, so I got very interested in, in um, geography as, as a little boy. Uh, and I think that led to my writing mainly about America. Um, as you probably know, America has got a number of regions, and actually for a while, uh, regionalists became rather popular in, in uh, geography departments, northeast and the middle Atlantic states. Uh, I do the same sort of thing, except I use only two regions. Uh, this is partly because of my math, uh, another one of my weak subjects. Uh, I was never able to persuade the mathematics teachers that many of my answers were meant ironically. <laughs> and, and, um, and I had trouble with pi, the as the pi r square sort of pi. Uh, <laughs> as you may know, the Texas State Legislature, <laughs> Gary's home legislature, um, passed a resolution some years ago in favor of changing pi to an even three. Um, <laughs> And, and I was for it. Sounded good to me. Uh, but anyway, I only have two regions. Um, I, I have the, the old United States, the ancien United States. There you've heard some of my French right there. Um, and that is made up of the part of the United States that had Major League Baseball before the Second World War. Um, <laughs> The rest of the United States is called the rest of the United States. Uh, and, or the expansion team United States, if you're, if you're looking for a kinder way of expressing it. Um, and if you, the way to tell where you are 
if you're traveling in America. Uh, the way to tell where you are, if you don't happen to be someone who followed Major League Baseball in 1945, uh, is if you go into an Italian restaurant in the Ancien United States, <laughs> Uh, the waiter's name is going to be Vinny or, or, or maybe even Luigi. Uh, if you go into an Italian restaurant and the waiter's name is Dwayne, <laughs> you're in the expansion team, you're not in the States. Um, and I, I've, I've been, I think, interested in, in the various states and how they distinguish themselves ever since those trips when I was a boy. Um, Many states in, in America have license plate mottos. I don't think that's a European custom. I think uh, only, it's, it, I would like to see some European. Uh, 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 I might even be able to suggest a few. Uh, I don't think I'll do it tonight. But, um, um, and the, and the, the license plate mottos in the, um, and for those of you who haven't uh, been to the last remaining superpower, um, uh, these are written right on the license plate. Um, and uh, in the East, they tend to be rather grandiose. New York, the Empire State. Uh, little New Hampshire, live free or die. Um, uh, the Midwest, where I'm from, much more modest. Uh, we're generally known for our modesty uh, in the Midwest. If there were such a thing as a regional license plate, our, our license plate would say, no big deal. <laughs> um, and I mean, Oklahoma's, for instance, says Oklahoma's OK. <laughs> That's a typical Midwestern license plate. Um, That's overstating it. <laughs> uh, some years ago, Wisconsin, a lot of people in Wisconsin seemed unsatisfied with their motto. They did. They didn't seem they were say they were adequately described by the motto "America's Dairyland." <laughs> uh, so some people suggested "Eat cheese or die." <laughs> uh, uh, there's somebody from Wisconsin. That, uh, <laughs> uh, um, and and someone uh, some states don't even have license plate mottos. They're so they're so modest. Uh, Nebraska, for instance. Mm. I thought of a very good one for Nebraska, a long way across. Uh, and Arkansas. My one from Arkansas needs a little work on it. It's a little wordy still to fit on license plates. It's not as bad as you might have imagined. Uh, the, uh, if you look at some of these cultural region books, uh, they will say that the people in, when people say people are very American or something is very American, they're usually talking about the customs and culture of the Midwest and the, and the uh, upper Midwest particularly. Um, so that those people are what you might think of as typical Americans or real Americans or what people in New York call out-of-towners. <laughs> um, and, and that's where I'm from. And, and uh, the typical vision of the Midwest is, is uh, fields of, of soybeans or, or wheat or corn, uh, silos in the distance holding all this stuff, mother in the kitchen baking bread, uh, not my own mother. Uh, I, my mother served her family for 30 years, nothing but leftovers. Uh, uh, they never found the original. It wasn't until I was out of college that I started thinking, leftover from what? <laughs> uh, but the original meal has never been found. Uh, the, and the Kiwanis Club, one of our service clubs, sort of like Rotary, uh, one of the Kiwanis Club meeting on Wednesdays, eating chicken a la king. Um, now, a lot of you have, uh, who aren't that old have never heard of Chicken a la King. Uh, but I want you to know that this, that this country, the United States of America, used to be awash in Chicken a la King. Um, the Kiwan in fact, I attended a lot of Kiwanis Club meetings as a reporter, and, I, and they had a song, uh, I'd rather be a Kiwanian than in any other club. And I actually made up a verse 
for them, which is there's nothing can defeat us, whatever life may bring, because we can go and eat us some chicken a la king. <laughs> uh, I'd rather be a Kiwanian than in any other club. Um, actually, chicken a la king, uh, very interesting in talking about regions in the United States, since it was a multi-regional, multi-class dish. It was a Kiwanis Club luncheon dish. But also, if you, if you went to a debutante party uh, in, in the North Shore of Long Island, um, and I know you're looking at me, how does he know about debutante? <laughs> um, well, I, it, I went to Yale, and, and there were a lot of people at Yale uh, with three last names. Uh, my own roommate, we called Thatcher Baxter Hatcher. <laughs> um, uh, his name was Thatcher Baxter Hatcher. You didn't actually call him those names. Uh, they all had little bitty nicknames like Mutt and Skip and things like that. Uh, Thatcher Baxter Hatcher was called Tush. Uh, <laughs> Tush, Tush Hatcher. Um, and he took me to debutante parties. Uh, and at debutante parties, uh, they had what they called supper around midnight. This was seven or eight hours after people at home had eaten supper. Uh, we tried to get everybody fed before dark in Kansas City. Um, <laughs> and they would walk out with trays, big silver, beautiful trays, and on the trays, chicken a la king. <laughs> Not as good as Kiwanis chicken a la king, but chicken a la king. Um, and in fact, there's one theory that that's why people from that background talk like this without moving their <laughs> teeth. The theory is that that glop that Chicken a la King is floating around in, uh, particularly if it has had contact with silver, uh, <laughs> particularly if the silver's been in the <coughs> family for more than three generations, <laughs> can cause the teeth to bind together. <laughs> um, so I, I ended up as an American report, a reporter. I have done some pieces in other countries, but. Uh, mainly, I've, I've reported about America, and for, for 15 years, I did uh, a piece every three weeks for The New Yorker uh, on somewhere in America. And uh, at the same time, a wonderful AP reporter named Jules Lowe was doing a similar series for the Associated Press, and we formed another group, uh, like IDPO, uh, which was the American Association of American Correspondents Covering America. Uh, <laughs> Our acronym was Gling Pack. We just sort of liked the name, the way that sounded, <laughs> Gling Pack. Uh, and our headquarters was O'Hare Airport uh, <laughs> in, in Chicago, uh, where we spent most of our time waiting for another plane. Um, as many of you know, O'Hare claims to be the busiest airport in the world. They say that more planes land and take off at O'Hare than any other airport in the world. What they don't tell you is a lot more land than take off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the only rival to O'Hare is Atlanta Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, Atlanta I is, is to boosterism what the Serengeti is to lions. Uh, Atlanta <laughs> is a fantastically boosteristic town, if that's mm -hmm. a word. Um, when I lived in Atlanta for a year, when, particularly whenever we passed the financial district of Five Points, the local booster would say, this was right in the middle of the Cold War, he would say, did you know that Atlanta is the fourth target on the Kremlin's map of nuclear destruction? <laughs> I don't know where this statistic came from. I, I assume <coughs> the Kiwanis Club had as a guest some civil defense general or something. And I never knew how to reply to, uh, <laughs> I mean, to a boast of nuclear annihilation. Um, finally, I said to somebody, I think it ought to be first. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> apparently, this is not the answer they're looking for. That's <laughs> uh, uh, the right answer. <laughs> anyway. Um, there were, there were only two of us also in uh, GLINGPAC, the American Association of American Correspondents Covering America. And our only rule was, you can't quote de Tocqueville. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we kept the membership down. Um, 
<laughs> I think one of the changes that I found in, in, uh, in the United States as I was traveling all those years um, came in the 70s. It came around the time of the bicentennial, but I don't think it had anything to do with the bicentennial. I don't have any reason to know. That is, people in America got more interested in their home turf and, and what they could do uh, locally uh, rather than judge themselves against New York, uh, a place they say they would, they would sooner live in Yakutsk, Siberia than New York. They got that straight. Um, but then they tried to sort of tell you about their important um, road show from, a, from Broadway or something like that. Uh, and, and, it, it, and they started having regional theater instead of all uh, Broadway reruns. And, um, and they also took more interest in their local crop. I mean, they would have the annual broccoli festival. You didn't realize that this place actually had broccoli growers in the region. Um, and, and you could tell a lot by their food. Their, by their, uh, when I started traveling, the, the Chamber of Commerce guy always suggested where I, is a restaurant that I generically called La Maison de la Casa House Continental Cuisine. <laughs> uh, la Maison de la Casa House Continental Cuisine. Um, well, I, f I wondered what they meant by continental cuisine, and I finally decided they were talking about Antarctica, where <laughs> everything starts out frozen. Uh, <laughs> It might have had something to do with the Continental <laughs> Railway Bus Company. Um, but it, it was often on top of an office building, spinning around um, with a fantastic view of another office building with a restaurant spinning around <laughs> or the municipal water treatment plant. And, and the spinning around was a problem because a, a woman could put her purse next to her and then by the time she looked back from the menu, it was halfway across the room. Um, <laughs> And I finally started telling people, I, I just, I, I have a condition, I can't eat 100 feet off the ground. Uh, so I, I quit going there. Uh, but they got so, um, they got so that, that they, they was, took more interest in what they could do themselves and uh, more interested in, in, in the local. Um, another change came from the, the law that I think has changed the country more than any other law in, in my memory, and that is the 1965 Immigration Act. Um, uh, before 1965, we had a national quota uh, system that was uh, skewed toward England, uh, the UK in general, and uh, Northern Europe. Um, and again, you can see in food uh, the effect of this. We were letting in more English people than wanted to come. Those quotas were never <laughs> filled. <laughs> and excluding Chinese. Um, well, in culinary terms, this is suicidal. <laughs> um, uh, this, this is based on the notion uh, that people eat, who eat bland food are better citizens than other people, which is not true. Um, <laughs> So there's a huge, there's a huge change in, in, in America uh, from, the, from this immigration so that uh, you're likely to find Vietnamese food in, in uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis didn't used to be a very good place to eat. I don't know if there's anybody from Minneapolis here. Uh, you could eat lutefisk, uh, which you had to eat to show you were a Scandinavian. Um, lutefisk is fish that soaked in lye for, as part of it, and that's not even the nastiest part of the preparation. Uh, but you had to eat it. I mean, in Scandinavia, it was sort of like teenage circumcision or something. Uh, um, but, but now they have a lot of Vietnamese. Uh, they have a lot of Somalis. Um, and in fact, I have to admit, I think some people, some people thought that this was um, probably in bad taste, but but uh, when, during the fall of Saigon, when, when people were flying helicopters off the roof and people were trying to get aboard the helicopters, I was uh, in front of, front of the television yelling, get the chefs, get the chefs. <laughs> um, uh, 
I think one thing that's never uh, uh, changed in America um, is the individualism. Um, and uh, I'm afraid the violence. I read a, a piece in the Washington Post some years ago that in Germany, and I suspect this is a law that isn't uh, uh, really obeyed strictly, but that in Germany, before you name the ba your baby, uh, you have to get the permission of the, of the, of the clerk, of a certain <laughs> clerk, uh, to name the baby. Uh, and it was a very good explanation of why. Uh, uh, he wouldn't allow names that could be either a girl or a boy, which has caused a lot of people a lot of trouble. Uh, some funny name that you didn't realize meant potato peel in Swahili oh. that, could, <laughs> that, could, that could hurt, really, be a, a pain for the child when it grew up. Um, and all that made a lot of sense, except in America, uh, and they said, this is for the protection of the child. In America, the question would, be, would have been, who's going to protect the clerk? <laughs> clerk wouldn't have lasted a week. <laughs> they would say, I can't name my child, you're telling me I can't name my child Moonbeam? Uh, you're telling my child I can't name my, you're telling me I can't name my child Kawana Viva? <laughs> Which that happens to mean potato peel in Swahili. <laughs> um, the, the, um, the clerk would be blown away within a week. Um, also, of course, one of the things that, that's changed, and the other thing is that Americans, even though statistics show that Western Europe is a more mobile society than the United States of America, uh, people in America devoutly believe that as the brilliant motto of the New York State Lottery says, hey, you never know, <laughs> uh, you could get rich. Uh, and, and so it, it um, and we also have the problem, uh, uh, I mean, a different way of looking at things in that this is a country that changed from isolationism in my lifetime to being the last remaining superpower, uh, supposedly the policeman of the world. So that's difficult. Um, and, and actually, I wrote a poem about that. Uh, I'll, I'll recite some poems later from memory. Uh, <laughs> this one I have to read, Thoughts on Geopolitics, because it's, it's been sort of a pain being the last remaining superpower, even before we were the last remaining superpower. This called Thoughts on Geopolitics. It seemed like such a good idea, oh, when did it begin to sour and start to be no fun to be the last remaining superpower? <laughs> um, also, we've had, we have to worry about terrorism now. Um, I'm not here to boast, God knows, but um, I made a brilliant prediction uh, about six or seven years ago in a book. Uh, this was at the time of the shoe bomber. I don't know if you all remember the shoe bomber. Uh, Richard Reed was his name. He was a, um, a Muslim convert uh, in England, described in the news reports as very suggestible. Um, my, my thought about the shoe bomber was very simple. It's a prank. They're the one Arab terrorist with a sense of humor, <laughs> Khalid the Droll, said, I bet I can make them all take their shoes off in airports. <laughs> <laughs> so he recruited this Schmendrick. <laughs> and and as, as you may remember, when he got on the plane, the, the, the fuses were hanging off his sneakers. He practically <laughs> asked the flight attendant for a light. I mean, it was, it was a very clumsy thing. He was obviously meant to be caught. And when I said that, I, I, I later said it on television. I said, you'll know I'm on to something if the next guy they catch is known because of his M.O. as the underwear bomber. <laughs> Sure enough, three or four years later, there was a guy with a bomb in his underpants, uh, which would have, by the way, if it had worked, uh, 
made that business about 72 virgins kind of moot, right? <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> and, and I was on um, my, 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 my grandson, who was then about six, saw me say this on television. And he saw the show, and then he said to his mother, Bobo said underwear on television. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a lot of points for that. Um, I'd like to recite a few poems, the ones I can remember. I, I, um, uh, I am, I guess, now the only deadline poet uh, in the United States. And um, uh, it came about in an odd way. I, um, it came about, I was inspired by John Sununu. Um, John Sununu was the chief of staff of George H.W. Bush, and he sort of stood out from everybody else. It, it was a very, it was a bad administration for people in the small joke trade, because it was, it was there was there were, weren't any serious scandals, um, and they all sort of looked alike. These kind of pleasant Ivy League guys, um, and John Sununu had that one element that attracts people like me. Uh, that his, he was very interested in showing he was the smartest guy in the room. Um, <laughs> I think it was Ed Rollins, the political campaign manager for the Republicans, who said, John Sununu is a lesson in the perils of telling your child that he has a high IQ. <laughs> um, and um, I kept thinking, also he had that beautiful name, Sununu. I think it's such a euphonious name, and I used to mumble it a lot particularly on the subway, Sununu, Sununu. Uh, and I finally wrote a poem called, If You Knew What Sununu. <laughs> uh, and I called the editor of The Nation, uh, uh, somebody I call the wily and parsimonious Victor S. Levasky. <laughs> and uh, I had done a column a few years before for the nation, but then I was doing it for newspapers or Time magazine, I can't remember. And um, he, uh, I had been paid $100 uh, for the column. Uh, he had, his original offer was something in the high two figures. <laughs> uh, but I turned that over to my high-powered literary agent and said, play hardball. <laughs> and so we, we got him up to 100. And in fact, he came, came to me a few weeks after I started writing the column and said, what about these quotes? And I said, what quotes are those? And he said, did John Foster Dulles really say you can't fool all of the people all the time, <laughs> but you might as well give it your best shot? And I said, Victor, at these rates, you can't expect real quotes. <laughs> uh, uh, So he said he would pay me $100, the same as for a column, even though, and he pointed out that poems are shorter than columns. Uh, well, I didn't think it was, it was a lot, but then uh, I looked at how poets are paid in the United States, and they're paid by the line normally. And at that time, and I suspect it's true now, the New Yorker was the highest paying magazine for, for I, I know there's some what my family calls grown-up poets here and they're going to be sad to hear this, or they already know it, if you're being reminded of it. I think the New Yorker was paying $10 a line. Uh, if you do the math, uh, you can see why there's not a huge crowd in front of the poetry booth at the career day fair. <laughs> um, but I was getting $100 a poem, no matter how long or short the poem was. So all I had to do to write to be the highest paid poet in the country was write, say, a two-line poem. <laughs> uh, uh, and so any time I wanted to get that buzz you get from working at the absolute top dollar in your field, <laughs> um, um, I would write a two-line poem. Um, like um, when uh, Lloyd Benson, the uh, late Texas senator, another one of Gary's <laughs> compatriots, uh, was um, was nominated for Secretary of Treasury, I said, I wrote a poem that was, the man is known for quo pro quidness. 
in Texas, that's how folks do business. <laughs> uh, that's $50 a line. <laughs> and <laughs> when uh, George W. Bush's college transcript was leaked uh, during the uh, primary campaign of 2000 to no appreciable effect on the campaign, uh, I wrote a two-line poem that was obliviously on he sails with marks not quite as good as quails. <laughs> $50 a line. <laughs> Even a four-line poem, I think maybe the one Gary was referring to was in 2008, I wrote uh, a poem about Mitt Romney, which was, yes, Mitt's so smooth of speech and smooth of garb, he reminds us all of Ken, of Ken and Barbie, so quick to shed his moderate regalia, he may, like Ken, be lacking genitalia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I think we, now that we've had some poetry, which always classes up the evening a little bit, uh, are there any questions? Uh, 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 this, this. <laughs>